What is a kiloton? A kiloton is 1,000 tons of TNT. So this would mean 210,000 tons of TNT would make an explosion that big. Okay, here now we're getting into the range of the Tunguska explosion. This is 10, this is megatons. Megatons is a million tons of TNT. So this would be 10 million 400,000 tons of TNT made this explosion right here. So this is another view of a 10 megaton explosion. And here we're up, you know, above the cloud layer. There's a 500 kiloton. So if you look at that explosion, the Tunguska explosion was probably 30 to 40 times more powerful than what you see right there. So this is interesting. To, this kind of puts it in a perspective for us because when we start looking at the largest nuclear bombs detonated by human beings, and see here, this is a mere one and one and a half megatons. So it was a thousand times greater than Nagasaki or Hiroshima. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. You know what's so bizarre is how beautiful these things are. Oh, I know. There's, there's, really yeah. Ugly. Really? Well, you look at this. Now, here's 11 megatons. So this is getting up into the ballpark of the Tunguska explosion. Oh, yeah. What I was about to say was that, you know, man now has learned how to detonate, you know, how, how to, to use nuclear energy to create uh, explosions that approach the range. Almost like when we start looking at, at, at the amounts of energy that we can manipulate and release from, say, an atomic bomb up through a large hydrogen bomb. And when we're talking megatons, we're talking hydrogen bombs. When we look at that scale of energies that we can release, when we get to the top end of that scale, we're basically at the bottom end of the cosmic scale. In other words, Tunguska represents a, just a small little piece of cosmic dust, essentially, that that happened into the Earth's atmosphere. 150 foot rock, like you said, is that all? Right? Mm -hmm. So, what we have now done, mankind has, has learned to manipulate energies that have just reached the bottom threshold of cosmic energies. Yeah, so there's Meteor Crater in Arizona. Arizona. Now this one, you've been there, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I have too. Been down there. You been there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't remember seeing you there. <laughs> <laughs> well, now see, interestingly, this hole was created by an object about the same size as Tunguska. What was the difference again? The weight. The weight. The density. The density. Right. This was an iron object that managed <laughs> to hit the ground before it exploded. Tunguska was a lighter weight object blew up five miles in the atmosphere. And this, this part of my program is Are ready Are there any for... other meteors like that in the United States? Near craters? Not that size. Well, let's see here. Yes. In fact, me and Brad are going to one in two weeks. We'll be at Upheaval Dome, which is almost ten times as big as Meteor Crater. But it's much older and much, much more eroded. Um, Where is it? Let's see here. It's so in there. Utah. There it is oh, right wow. there. Let me come early yeah. and talk How about that? <laughs> yeah, is yeah. that a double crater? <laughs> yes. Well, it's a multi ring. Multi ring, okay. Now, for, for millions of years, this crater was buried. But then, after the uplift of the Colorado Plateau, all of the cap rock on top of it got stripped away by erosion and it exposed the core of this ancient 65 million year old crater. The feature we're looking at here is about five miles across, I believe. Is that right, Brad? Yeah, yeah, that's about right. That's about right. However, this... Well, all of it's not in the, right. in the screen there. The original goes crater actually may be much bigger than that. We may be looking at the intersections of it. Yeah, yeah there's, there's three or four rings, it looks like. You see an overhead shot. So that's how people don't. Okay, well, okay, the main thing I wanted to show you about the, uh, the Tunguska was the fact that there were these shallow elliptical holes associated with it.
Okay, so let's get back to the Carolina Bakers. This is where we left off, right here. Okay, so the, this shows Carolina Bay orientation. If you see the ones in Georgia, their long axis is much more north-south than the ones in the Carolinas. They're more, more to the northwest, southeast. So, so the Georgias are going to be more round and those are going to be more... And Georgias are more round. And what this suggests is you had multi, either multiple objects or you had one object that went through uh, a series of fragmentations causing the secondary or tertiary pieces to split and go in different directions. And now what's the remnants well, left above the, the fall line in the hard rock? Well, nothing. See, that's where you get the ghost bays that disappear. But they have found many, many meteorites throughout the southern Appalachians. And that's what Melton and Schreiber were talking about. Maybe all of those meteorite fragments found throughout the Appalachians may be related. Elliptical sand rim bays, are, this is in 1952, are not being formed anywhere in the world at the present time as far as known. Most bays are associated with other bays of slightly different age. These associated bays frequently overlap. Now, we have seen from looking at known impact craters on the moon and so forth that that is one of the characteristics of craters. They overlap. What, what do you mean by slightly? Do, slightly. Well, that could be... A thousand years? Or it could be a, two seconds. <laughs> and if we assume that it was one strike... Well, see, he's saying here, uh, the similarity of development and the condition of preservation of bays in all parts of the Bay Country seems to indicate that they are all about the same age. Yeah, and here he's commenting about, you know, the area to the northwest of the known Bay Country has yielded more meteorites than any other equal area in the United States. Bottom samples from the deeper part of some of the bays in Bladen County, North Carolina, taken from beneath the peat deposits, show a thickness of several feet of light-colored silt, which, according to B.W. Wells in a personal communication, is of wind-blown character. The deposition of silt over the coarse bottom sand shows that the bays were formed suddenly and were soon filled with water then followed sedimentation from a wind-swept barren area. This is interesting because at the time the bays formed, all the evidence suggests that the southeastern United States was heavily forested. Melton and Schreiber state the obvious fact that the bays, if they are of meteoric origin, must be no older than the youngest formations in which they occur. These bays clearly cut beach ridges developed on late Pleistocene terraces. And here's a photograph where you can actually see Carolina bays cutting across ancient beach ridges. See these, mm, you yeah. see these lines here are the beach ridges. These are ancient where the ocean was up here. So you have these ancient beach ridges. The Carolina bays are cut across them, are superimposed. So clearly, the bays are younger than the beach ridges that they, right. that they're, that they cut, yes. Cool. The Waccamaw River meanders across the upper left, somewhere oh, up there. Oh, also, the ocean levels were much higher. Well, yeah. the bay on the, on the uh, edge. It's about yeah. the egg there. Right on the edge, left Randall, you don't have any idea of the time period between those ridges. No, but I'm going to guess that those ridges are probably at least 100,000 years old. But when how much time difference between them? That's hard to say. It's probably one of those periods like the Eemian interglacial where it appears um, sea levels were 30 or 40 feet higher than now. Now, if you go back to where this, when the coastline came up to the fall line at Macon, that's like millions of years ago. And I don't think those beach ridges are that old. This is probably, you know, during the Pleistocene, probably within the last couple of hundred thousand years when the ocean, 
this implies that the total ice mass on Earth was considerably less than now. Because in order for sea level to be higher, there has to be less ice. And then, of course, that also implies a warmer climate than now. Is so that the current ocean, or is that the current bay? To the this is the ocean line? right here. Right there, okay. Right. Yeah. I was yep. the Orient there. <laughs> yeah, so you can see the ocean has been up here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to be up that far, it may not need to be more than 20 or 30 feet above its present level. Now, where would Al Gore's, uh, you know, his dire prediction, if you were to guess on this photograph, where he's saying it's going to be? You know what I mean? Like two inches up? Oh, I think way. a foot, a couple of feet, probably enough to, to put Myrtle Beach under. The first, so the the first road, the beachfront road. That's where the, so yeah, that's the beachfront the road. road. Okay. But not, not, not high enough to, to get up where those sea levels were. Where the other were, original right? ones no. were, yeah. Right. Okay. This is a more recent color photograph. They're forming some. They're farming some of that. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll see here. Uh, yeah. There's a digital relief map oh, yeah. oh, near the Cape Fear River area. Oh, That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Yeah, it is awesome. Delicious colored moon. Well, yeah. Other than the elliptical ellipticity of it, it does have almost a lunar yeah. appearance, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. When you strip away the vegetation and. And there's Lake Waccamaw. That is the largest known Carolina Bay, and I believe mm. it's seven miles along its long axis. Let's wow. see. Yeah. Ooh. Pretty close. Yeah. So you can see some of them are completely filled in and overgrown with forests. Some of them have lakes. Some of them are swamps. Some of them are farmland. You don't know which way north is in these photos, do you? Well, let's see. Uh, given that the sand rims are on the south and the east, I would say you that that's north that the, way. In the corner. <laughs> yeah. And here we're getting into, you know, where it starts for, more like the ghost bays mm -hmm. that I was talking about. They as you fade out. It, yes, they fade out. As you move up out of the soft, sandy coastal plain, <clears throat> they start fading out. Be good for a golf course, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, I would bet there's some of these that probably do have a golf course yeah. in them. Yeah. yeah. And there you can see there we're we're you know they're they're slowly disappearing as you move further inland, which makes me think then that the strike zone is not limited to the coastal plain. It's just that the coastal plain is where they're preserved. Right. right. They show that the most. Yeah. Yes. Have you run across any reference in the uh, Indians? Yeah, yeah, that's well, you notice that the name of the largest Carolina Bay is Lake Waccamaw, right? Yeah. Okay. Hold, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Okay, look at this. This is cool. You can see a lot of them here. Yeah, yep, there's a lot of them strewn about. And here are some images of Georgia's Carolina Bays. So there's there's the main where the main concentration of them is in South Central Georgia. Yeah. Near Adel or Adel, Adel, yeah. Arabia Swamp, <laughs> Banks Lake Bay. Now you'll notice that the, ba the the Georgia Bays. Well, let's see. Some of them are fairly elliptical, but others are a little bit more stout. So no, a steeper angle. Yeah. Notice this right here, Arabia Swamp. In, that's what it looks like on the topo map. That's what it, this is what it looks like from an air, old aerial photograph. And, let's see, and this, I took this photograph. The problem was the day we went up, it was raining. So all of the, the glass on the airplane window kept fogging over. But you can pretty much, you can see it's very, very circular looking. So here's what, what Cox Orowski said in 1977 about the bays. The origin of the Carolina Bays has been something of a geological enigma since their existence in the coastal plain was first recognized in 1848. Theories have been proposed for the origin of the bays that have been proposed for the origin of the bays are numerous and diverse. Surprisingly, however, most workers seem to have neglected the concept of uniformitarianism in their studies of these remarkable features. Hence, few investigations have been designed to compare or contrast 
the Carolina Bays with modern analogs in Alaska, Chile, and Texas. Now, let me say this. He's being very disingenuous here. He's saying modern analogs in Alaska, Chile, and Texas. Well, having now examined and read through the literature on the so-called modern analogs in Alaska, Chile, and Texas, they aren't modern analogs. They're probably as old as the bays. But he says they've neglected the concept of uniformitarianism. What does he mean by that, Sam? That, that what they're doing is, well, they're not looking at normal processes. That's what he's saying. He's, his main criticism here is these people who've talked about all of this stuff, they're not looking at normal processes. Then he goes on to say, investigations of oriented lakes and bays in these different geographic areas have shown that the processes that initially produced them apparently differ. However, absolutely no evidence has been encountered that would support an extraterrestrial origin. Incipient oriented lakes develop in <laughs> topographic depressions created by coastal, fluvial, aeolian, solutioning, glacial, periglacial, and perhaps some tectonic processes. In all cases, oriented lake development has occurred in unconsolidated sediments easily transported by wave action. Now notice here he's doing the Douglas Johnson routine. He's invoking every conceivable kind of process. They're, the bays are young. They're under 20,000 years old. Okay. Let's go on here. I think we're probably running out of time. This is what he says. He goes on to say, and this is the way he dismisses the possibility of it being extraterrestrial. Few known impact craters on Earth or other planets could be classified as being elliptical due to the fact that meteorites are generally believed to explode on impact, producing a spherical rather than an elliptical crater. If one therefore assumes that these craters are not spherical because the meteorites did not explode on impact, the logical conclusion would be that at least some meteorites would remain. However, no meteorite material has ever been discovered in association with any bays. Now, he's saying this back in 1977. Notice, though, that he's totally ignoring the Tunguska type of phenomenon. He's talking about where meteorites impact the ground. And he's saying, well, these things are not like what we see when meteorites impact the ground. Therefore, they can't be extraterrestrial. And secondly, he says that no meteorite material has ever been discovered in association with the bays. So, also notice, he says, I've got it underlined here, he says that the oriented lakes develop in topographic depressions. Now, what he's saying, conveniently, is the depressions are already there, and now all these other processes come in to somehow turn these depressions into these nice oriented ellipses. And then he goes on to say that in retrospect, it is rather unfortunate that the meteorite theory ever made its way into the literature, since many laymen, <laughs> even a number of geologists, still subscribe to it, in spite of the fact that no concrete supportive evidence whatsoever exists. Bring it to a close in ten minutes. Oh, yeah. Ten minutes should be just enough. If we don't, don't, let's keep on track. A problem encountered in many geomorphic <laughs> studies is assessing or classifying a landform as being either being the product of mainly catastrophic occurrences or normal day-to-day -day average events. If a major storm event is assumed to consist of wind, of winds with velocities near 50 miles per hour, some evaluation of this question can be made with regard to oriented lakes in general. Assuming that a storm event of this magnitude lasts for a period of 24 hours and were to influence an area with a frequency of roughly one day per month, it would produce the same results in terms of sediment transport as all of the other normal days of that month combined. He goes on, uh, basically what he does is he then, he says, assuming that a storm event of this magnitude lasts for a period of 24 hours, uh, no. Yeah, here's the bottom line. He says it is safe to assume that daily processes rather than catastrophic events are more effective. So here's what he does. To make his case, 
he gets a, a, a tray and he puts packed sand in it. And then he, let's see if he, if I've got the, then what he does is he creates a hole. Then he sets up these big fans and blows the wind across the hole that he's already created in the sand. And when he lets it run, this is what he gets after four hours. Now, to me, that looks more like a football than a Carolina Bay. Yeah. But the interesting thing is here, in his experiment, if you read his paper, what he does is he gets this, and the first thing he does is he, he makes some holes in the sand. <laughs> then he sets up his fans to try to show that, yeah, see what... So he sets up these big fans, and he blows, and he moves the fans around in order to finally get a shape that sort of approximates the Carolina Bay. And yet, this work was taken as authoritative by a lot of geologists who didn't really want to look into it any further. Now, this is Robert Covers, the, 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 the one guy that I was talking about. This was written in 1997. Robert Covers, an independent researcher in Athens, Georgia, has studied Carolina Bays for nearly 20 years in conjunction with his larger interest in impact threats from space. His recent self-published investigations have profound consequences for Carolina Bay study and demand research by academia as serious, relevant, and previously unexamined new information. The essence of Kober's theory is that the search for de debris and the comparison of bays with traditional impact craters falsely and naively assumes that circular craters with extraterrestrial material in them are the only terrestrial evidence of past encounters with objects entering Earth's atmosphere. To explain the bays, Kober's proposes a similar encounter, albeit of larger proportions and more accurately described as a near miss. The Kober's event proposes that a comet, if you liked, whipped past the Earth, exchanging enormous energy but not impacting directly to form a typical crater. It is demonstrable that such an encounter would show an intense flash of heat onto the ground below. Yeah, to verify that such encounters are possible outside of the physics lab, we need look no further than the so-called Tunguska event. On June 30, 1908, in the vicinity of the Tunguska River in Siberia, a tremendous explosion instantly leveled 2,000 square kilometers of tundra. At the epicenter of the explosion lay not a large crater with a rock in it, as might be expected, but nothing more than a number of neat oval bogs. The Tunguska literature generally mentions the bogs only in passing, since Kulik failed in digs there to locate any evidence of a meteorite and went on to examine other aspects of the explosion. Perhaps ironically, Melton and Shriver, around the same time, but on the opposite side of the world, were fruitlessly searching their own neat oval bogs for evidence of a meteor, neither apparently having the knowledge of Kulik's efforts, or vice versa. So, in Henry Savage's book, he mentions something really interesting. Near Camden, South Carolina, is a long farm drainage ditch with a depth of about 14 feet. Exposed at the bottom of the ditch are masses of prostrate timbers, many of considerable size, indicating a massive blowdown if those logs show a carbon-14 date corresponding to the birth of the bays, we would have a dramatic curtain raising on a day of disaster like no other in the history of man. Now, I would like to try to go find that ditch, although it's, what, 26 years old now. It may not be there anymore. But this is exactly the kind of evidence that you would look for, macro-scale evidence. And notice what he's discussed. At the bottom of the ditch are masses of prostrate timbers, clearly suggestive of and remindful of what we see at, at Tunguska. Henry Savage goes on to say, I am persuaded that the results of those studies, together with the immense store of data already available, can furnish firm answers to the salient unresolved questions inherent in the riddle of the bays. Meanwhile, one's answer must be given on the basis of the evidence thus far presented. 
Recalling Watson's 1936 article that so tellingly attacked Melton and Shriver's original hypothesis and his conclusion that although it is possible to have a comet nucleus of the size required to create the Carolina Bays, it is improbable. I submit this response to introduce my concluding chapter. Although a comet nucleus may well be improbable, so also is the gigantic, spectacular, and unique Carolina Bay phenomenon. Nevertheless, it is there on the face of the earth, and an immense force, equally unique and most certainly improbable, must have put it there. It is there, blatantly displayed, demanding an acceptable explanation, even if that explanation must postulate a rare and exceptional event. Good brain. Oh yeah, it's a great book. Most of the evidence that we have has been derived from detailed investigative studies of nature's weathered fingerprints. No easy determination is possible from fingerprints weathered by the lapse of thousands of years without having in evidence exhibits of the instruments that wrought the violence, if indeed theirs was a violent birth. Inherent in the problem are all the pitfalls and uncertainties of solving a murder mystery without the murder instrument or even the knowledge of what it was, without eyewitness testimony and without contemporary documentary evidence. As I read the evidence, however, it clearly tells of an awful day the like of which there has been no other since man first walked the earth. And I would argue that since that was written in 1982, all of that stuff that was missing back then that provided the conclusive evidence is right here, published last year. Evidence for an extraterrestrial impact 12,900 years ago that contributed to the megafaunal extinctions and the Younger Dryas cooling, both of which we've talked about extensively in here. Well, that would be right at the start of the melt-off of the last ice age. Yes. Had. And Jerry, you asked about Native Americans, right? Mm -hmm. Let me show you something here. The Lake Wakama gets its name from the Wakama Indian tribe. When you research the Wakama Indian tribe, see, I had the same question you did, Jerry. This was probably late 90s. I had the same question. Did the indigenous peoples have any tradition at all? So I did some research. I found out that one of the prevalent tribes, southeastern Indian tribes of that area, was the Wakama Indian tribe, which gave their name to the lake, which happens to be the biggest of the Carolina Bays. So then doing research on the Wakama Indian tribe, uh, this is what I found. The Wakama tribe, <laughs> their name means literally the people of the falling star. Cool. Uh -huh. And their legends is that the, that the Lake Wakama was created in a great fiery catastrophe when a star fell to earth. When I came across this, I knew that I was right. I knew that the meteoritic theory was had to be the correct. Let's quickly refer to this. Um, this is, uh, the date on this is October 2007. So that was when this was first published. And when we look in here, we discovered that all over North America, at what are called the Clovis sites, the Clovis, you know, we talked in, in our discussion about the extinction of the great mega mammals, we talked about the overkill hypothesis, the theory that these, he, he, that these hunters came in across the Bering Land Bridge, swept south, and slaughtered all the woolly mammoths and everything else in their path. This was the Clovis people. Well, what has now been discovered is that the Clovis artifacts all disappear at the same time all over the country. Mm -hmm. And there's a marker that below which the Clovis artifacts are present, but above which they don't exist. And that marker 
and I'm going to read here, is a carbon-rich black layer dated to 12,900 years ago. It has previously been identified at 50 Clovis Age sites across North America and appears contemporaneous with the abrupt onset of Younger Dryas cooling. The on-site bones of extinct Pleistocene megafauna along with Clovis tool assemblages occur below this black layer but not above or within it. Causes for the extinction, Younger Dryas cooling, and termination of Clovis culture have all been, have long been controversial. In this paper, we provide evidence for an extraterrestrial impact event at 12,900 years ago, which we hypothesize caused abrupt environmental changes that contributed to Younger Dryas cooling, major ecological reorganization, broad-scale extinctions, and rapid human behavioral shifts at the end of the Clovis period. Clovis age sites in North America are overlaid by a thin, discrete layer with varying peak abundances of magnetic grains with iridium. Where have we found iridium? KT boundary. Yes, in the KT boundary, right. Um, magnetic <clears throat> microspherules, charcoal, soot, carbon spherules, glass-like carbon containing nanodiamonds, fullerenes with extraterrestrial helium locked in their cages, all of which are evidence for an <clears throat> extraterrestrial impact and associated biomass burning at approximately 12,900 years ago. Now, get this. This layer also extends throughout 15 Carolina bays that were studied. These are unique elliptical depressions oriented to the northwest across the Atlantic coastal plain. We propose that one or more large, low-density extraterrestrial objects exploded over North America partially destabilizing the ice sheets and triggering Younger Dryas cooling. The shockwave, thermal pulse, and event-related environmental effects, such as extensive biomass burning, contributed to the end Pleistocene megafaunal extinctions and adaptive shifts among Paleo-Americans. So they examined 15 Carolina bays. They went into the rims, and in every single bay, they looked in, they found the iridium, the fullerenes, the magnetic grains, the microspherules, all of that stuff that guys like Cox Sorowski are dismissing back, you know, 30 years ago, saying, well, there has been no evidence whatsoever because we didn't find this big meteorite laying in the middle of the hole. Therefore, it's not extraterrestrial. And then that became the consensus opinion. However, as we're now finding out, you know, and here's a very good article. You can go online and get this. It's called The Clovis Comet. I was gonna, ran out of time. I was going to make copies of this for everybody. But uh, The Mammoth Trumpet, really good online journal that covers a lot of this kind of stuff. It's called The Clovis Comet. I think if you just Google Clovis Comet, you'll get this article in a PDF file. And... Uh, so one of the sites that Brad and I are going to visit on our trip is the, is the Clovis site in New Mexico at Blackwater Draw where the black carbon rich mat is, is clearly exposed. And if there, nobody's looking, we're going to take some of it. <laughs> yeah, I'm really good at that. They don't really? Do they have a real accurate time on the asteroid belt? No. But it would have been a long time. A lot earlier than this, I think. Well, um, and this is enough to cause Earth-wide catastrophic effects. Oh, absolutely! Well, right, so close, Chief. Especially, <laughs> yeah. Especially when you realize that probably at least half the planet was involved. Well, you remember what I showed you before a couple of weeks ago when I showed you the map of what I think, now I haven't shown you the full map that I've been working on showing what I believe were actual impacts. 
actual impacts whose effects have been masked by virtue of the fact that they were into a mile to two mile thick ice sheet. Mm -hmm. However, I think that that's going to be the next the next phase of research into this when we begin to realize that an impact onto an ice sheet. In fact, I'm even going to go a little further. I have a, no, a new theory now that I'm going to try to figure out how to test, and that is that a major impact of a large object, multi-kilometer object, into the ice sheet may have caused a secondary uh, debris bombardment, which is something that nor happens normally, except that the debris bombardment may have been actually glacial ice. And that might be something to consider investigating as far as what caused the Carolina Bays, is the rain down of ice. Ice, ice. yes. From yep. the impact. The, and where was the impact? Well, this is, will be the, the, one of our future ones. The map that I'm preparing is to show that there were, what I think, four or five impacts over the ice sheet itself. And I showed you the first one, the one up in the Canadian Rockies a couple of weeks yeah. ago. And that was the one that caused the massive flood. That's, That's what would have caused the, the, the Missoula flood. And it's all at the same time, so 12,900. 12,900 years ago. And what's significant about 12,900 years ago? That's the great year. That's the perfect great year model. You know, that's when we... Half of that. Yeah, half of it. Yeah. Goes back to the, to the dawning of the age of Leo, 13,000 years ago. Uh -oh. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you. Yeah.